the Haunted Vermont podcast. My name is Paul Dosky, and I'm on camera for once because, well, um, yeah, the other way was not working, so here's the new way of trying it. So I'm going to right now apologize about my background. <laughs> um, I've been organizing, trying to go through some stuff, so unfortunately, this is my background today, so I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Anyway. Without further ado, we have our lovely guest, Robert Burnell Jr., or should I say Robert Waldo Burnell Jr. How do you do? Hello, everyone. So, Robert, you know, uh, we've had a written interview with you before um, for the Haunted Vermont website back in 2021 or two. forgive me, um, I don't have it up at the moment, but... Anyway, I figured it was time that, you know, maybe we could try to get you on for more of an audio session, and here we are. So, I guess I want to start with, you know, for those that may not have had a chance to read that written interview, uh, how would you describe yourself? Well, I'm a Vermont uh, native. My family's lived here for 200 years. I'm a artist and a retired art teacher. I'm a book illustrator and a political cartoonist. Um, I'm a painter. You can see one of my paintings on the rack behind me. And I'm the vice president of the Northern Vermont Artist Association, and I'm a founding member of the Vermont Comic Creators Group. In 1997, I launched my political strip, Mr. Purnell Explains It All which appears monthly in The Funny Times and on Humor Times. And I participate in many art shows in Northern Vermont. I got stuff all over the place at the moment. This is our busy season. And I'm also a book illustrator. And <clears throat> for the last 12 years or so, I've been illustrating books with my friend Joseph Citro, who's Vermont's leading authority on everything weird and unusual. And we've done, let's see, three and six books together so far and we have one in the works right now we've also done two posters the vermont monster map and the vermont haunted house map perfect man mm -hmm. uh you know i have both your posters and i don't have all your books that you've done together because i'm just picky like that at this point <laughs> in time um but it to be fair it's more like i i feel like i already have uh the Green Mountain Dark Tales, the from back when that was originally published with the uh, purple cover of Joe mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's like, do I do I really need like a like separation of what you guys are doing to for the Green Mountain Dark Tales really? But uh, anyway, that that was just my take on it. But I know basically you and him are sp splitting it up into. Um, I believe I heard 13 volumes. That was our long range plan. Whether we'll get all 13 done remains to be seen, but I should point out that each new volume has additional material that's not in the original. That is not in the original. Yeah, he's expanding and adding stories. Essentially, his idea was to break the book up into themes. So one about ghosts, one about curious encounters, classic tales and so forth. And we'll probably end up doing one on Bigfoot because that's common in Vermont. And uh, who knows what else he's got up his sleeve. But he's always unearthing new material. So there's always more stories to be told. Perfect. Perfect. So, Robert, um, to kind of get into this a little bit. So, you know, you, you were a teacher. You, you teach art class still, at least as far as I'm aware and stuff like that. But... Um, I think this is also one of the questions that, you know, I, um, somebody was asking to begin with. So I'm going to basically say that Queen City Ghost Walk asked, so when did you first know that art was your uh, thing? Well, artists are born, not made. At least it was my case. I learned to draw before I learned to write. Um, Fortunately, I had parents who made sure that my siblings and I always had plenty of drawing paper and plenty of pencils. I came from a working class family. My father was a plumber. We didn't have a lot of money, but 
my mother used to get giant end rolls from the newspaper and rip off sheets of it, and I would spend hours and hours and hours drawing, teaching myself how to draw. So I've done it my whole life. Uh, it wasn't until I was in the sixth grade, I guess, that I realized that I had a talent that other people didn't have. Prior to that, I just assumed everybody can do this. But it was around the sixth grade, you know, when you're like 12 or 11, that I started getting people paying attention to it and saying, wow, that's really good. So that, of course, encouraged me. And I went to Catholic schools, which didn't have art programs, so I was more or less self-taught. So I didn't really learn to paint until I went to college, St. Michael's College. So I made my first painting in 1978, and I've been painting ever since. Um, but I've always done it. Part of the issue is that uh, I suffer from chronic migraine. So I was, even as a child, I was one of those kids that couldn't run around in the hot the sunshine, you know, to make my head hurt. So I would stay in a dark room all summer drawing pictures. <laughs> And my brother is also an artist, and my sister is a historian, but she also dabbles in art on the side. So it runs in the family. In my studio, I have paintings made by my great grandmother back in the 1800s. So it's a it's a family tradition, I guess. Oh wow, that is incredible. Now, real quick, since you touched on being a painter and you mentioned you're a cartoonist and stuff. One of the other questions that I got from uh, Michael Heath is, do you enjoy cartooning or are you more of a painter? Ooh, that's a tough one. It's, it's a 50-50. Um, I probably started drawing cartoons before I became a painter. Um, so I've been ca cartooning since I was a little kid. And there are two separate parts of the brain, I suppose. In my case, cartooning is more about writing than it is about drawing. My drawing, if you've seen my cartoons, the drawings are relatively minimal. As one reviewer said, it's talking heads. <laughs> uh, sort of like Doonesbury was one of my inspirations. So for me, I think doing cartooning is more about writing than it is about making art. Uh, it takes me longer to write the captions than it does to make the drawings because inevitably you have to edit, edit, edit because you have a limited space. As I tell people when I do my cartooning classes, writing a cartoon is like writing haiku poetry. You have to squeeze a maximum of thought into a minimum of space. So inevitably I write too much and then I whittle it down, whittle it down, whittle it down. <laughs> And you've got to decide who's going to deliver the punchline. And you put them in the last panel. <clears throat> and you've got to set up the joke. And you've got to get them to land on the punchline. So it's a challenge. It's a lot of fun. Um, I'm a political cartoonist. So most of my cartoons are about commentating on, on not just politics, but current events and current fads and the idiocy of modern life. So I wouldn't see myself doing things like a comic book, superheroes, that kind of thing. It's, um, I would have flourished 50 years ago back in the heyday of the single panel gag cartoons because in those days every magazine had a cartoon section. But unfortunately nowadays it's a hard, it's a hard sell. As far as paintings, that's my serious art. That's, that's the stuff that goes in galleries and so on and so forth. Well, technically, you did make a painting recently with your solar equips. So, um, did that go into a gallery? I know a lot of people were more asking for a print for it. Yeah, that that's an interesting fluke. I made that painting. Well, first of all, I made it. That's the actual view that my wife and I had from our front yard. And I made the painting, and I said, I'm going to put this in a particular show that was coming up. And she says, no, you can't. That's my painting. You cannot sell it. So I had to make another one exactly like it. <laughs> so the original is now hanging in our house. The replica is the one that I turned into a print only because somebody said, I love this. Do you do prints? Because I can't afford the original painting. So I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. Well, so far I've sold 30 prints. <laughs> I've made more money selling the prints than I would ever make selling the actual painting. So the painting itself is now home, but it's going to go in a show 
I think I'm going to put it in the fair show that's coming up. But I do have the prints available. I have more prints available. There you go. And um, normally people just contact you through your uh, your email. Yep. All you have to do, I'm selling for 35 bucks. Just email me at brunels3 at AOL.com, and I will send you directions on how to get one. There you go. Perfect. Now, just... I'll, I'll let this one slide in here because it kind of goes into the whole cartoonist and painting thing. Michael Heath, again, um, and, and this is more of a comment, but I'm, uh, I'm, I swear I'm going to butcher this word, so I am I apologize, Robert and uh, <laughs> Michael, but I'm, I'm hard hearing too, so some words aren't the, the, uh, the greatest for me, and this is definitely one of them. So anyway, Michael Heath's comment is, you are you are good at whatever, but other cartoon, uh, cartoonists want to know your Hooper Square Hooper Square. Uh, oh God, uh, Hopper Hopper Square. Hopper esque. Is that yeah. the word? Hopper esque. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, Hopper esque. Um, people painted in true Vermont landscape. Uh, set us in awe. And then, yeah, you kind of touched on, uh, he, he says, yet yeah, deep down you like to cut in on politics for fun. I think he's referring to my well-known affection for a fellow named Edward Hopper. Here. Uh, Edward Hopper, in my opinion, is one of the great artists, and he's my influence. The very first art review ever written of my show they're the ones who coined the phrase Hopper-esque. So Hopper is my, is my hero. And if you're familiar with Hopper's work and you compare it to my work, you'll see how much he's influenced me. Like him, I'm interested in urban landscapes. Even though I'm a long, old Vermonter, I don't do bucolic landscapes and covered bridges and barns and cows like the, the Flatlander artists do. Um, <coughs> I grew up in Rutland, where you're at now, right? Correct. Yeah. You know, and so I, you know what Rutland's all about. It's sort of a post-industrial town, but a lot of Victorian mansions. And I used to be the curator of the Rutland Historic Society Museum back in the 70s. And I used to do walking tours of the old houses and stuff. So I love Victorian architecture. I love urban neighborhoods. I love that kind of landscape like Hopper did. So I think that's what he's referring to. And I also liked Hopper's color schemes. He, uh, he liked saturated, rich tones in his paintings, which I do too. If you go to my website, mrburnell.com, you'll see examples of what I'm talking about. Perfect. Yeah, I've been to your website, and I've seen a lot of examples of, of your work. And, I mean, I will say, like, you have... a uh, lot of unique different um i'm just gonna say modes i guess i don't or mood maybe might be better but like really depends on um i guess what you're trying to portray or create or say like like you know with your politics stuff that you sometimes do sometimes you just do yourself in like the um in the political sense, or maybe not even the political sense of maybe, I'll just say, uh, common sense of people nowadays. And uh, Well, my cartoon character, Mr. Burnell, who is the cartoon version of me, gets to say and do things that I can't in real life. Especially when I was a teacher. I remember being interviewed uh, by Channel 3 News about 15 years ago. They came to my studio. And uh, we talked about that. I said, the cartoon me is freer than the real me. So I got the idea of making myself the hero of my strip from Robert Crumb, who's one of my heroes. He was the great underground cartoonist. And he's the star of a lot of his own strips. And so I did the same idea. It's like, the, the cartoon Mr. Burnell is a middle-aged curmudgeon who looks tongue-in-cheek at the follies of the modern world. and comments on them. I have a rather pessimistic worldview. I am a liberal left-leaning, so that's my political point of view. But I try to skewer both sides uh, equally, if possible. 
Oh, that's fair enough, I feel like. I mean, you kind of need a bounce somewhere, right? <laughs> My mother used to always say, the truth is usually in the middle. That is fair. <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> All right, Robert. Now, you know... I know I asked you this in the written form, so I guess I'll ask you it again here. So, I mean, I know, I know where Joe usually stands on this uh, particular subject when it comes to like the paranormal and stuff. And as you said, you were brought up Catholic and stuff. Uh, so, um, I guess what I'm trying to say here is: so, what is your own opinion on the whole like? you know, paranormal, the unknown. I'm a believer. Unlike Joe, oddly enough. Even though Joe collects these stories, he's in reality very skeptical. And he debunks them whenever possible. And he keeps an open mind, but I don't think he believes in the paranormal as deeply as I do. Um, he sees himself more as a folklorist. His idea is to preserve the stories. That's what interests him, because he's an author, he's a writer, and he wants to collect these stories and preserve them for posterity. Myself, on the other hand, I'm a firm believer in ghosts. I've had family members who have seen them. Uh, my wife grew up in a haunted house. She and her siblings saw ghosts. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I do believe in the afterlife and all that spirit world. So... Um, I think ghosts have a scientific component to them. I think there might be a scientific explanation. My own personal theory is that they are energy patterns that are absorbed by surrounding materials. Because very often ghosts do the same thing over and over again every time they're seen, like a tape loop. And they it's sort of like watching a movie. And I think people's brains are tuned in to the frequency very often you'll have a group of people who see a ghost at the same time, but one person will see it very distinctly and the other people will see it kind of fuzzy or hazy and, and the other person won't see it at all. And I think it's because their brain waves are all at different frequencies, like listening to a radio. Either you're tuned in to the frequency or you're not. And I think some people are tuned in and some people aren't. But yeah, I believe in all of it. Yeah, Bigfoot, <laughs> monsters, I think Nessie... Uh, exists, I think. Uh, Champ exists. I, the uh, the um, monster map that Joe and I created, they're all there. I, I think they're real. There you go, man. Even uh, Bat Boy, I think that's his name. <laughs> Could be. Who's to say? Weird things have happened. That's right. When I did the monster map, the picture of the human-faced calf that came from an actual photograph. That thing really existed <laughs> back in the 1920s. So, you know, one of my favorite quotes it was from a scientist whose name I've forgotten now. He said, not only is the universe stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. Hmm. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, um, so have you ever seen that photograph that you just mentioned? The photograph of the calf? Yeah. Yes, I found it online, actually. It is online? Hmm. Yeah, it was from the 1920s. So, I guess, because I haven't seen this photo, so I'm tr now I'm trying to like ask you specifically. <laughs> so, would you, would you say that it looked pretty real versus it possibly being like a taxidermy? Um... I don't think it was photo manipulated because this is back in 100 years ago. They didn't have Photoshop. Was it deliberately faked? Possible. It's hard to say. It's an old black and white photo. You know, you can't see the stitches or anything. It was stuffed. You know, it, it, was, uh, it was taxidermic already. It had died. And it would, uh, so the photo was of the stuffed specimen. So it's hard to say. And it, I don't think it exists anymore, so who knows? <laughs> well, let's hope it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a great aunt that used to exhibit a two-headed cow at the Rutland Fair back in the 40s. So stranger things have happened. Again, <laughs> that's interesting. Well, that's like, um, what did I hear re recent, like a couple months ago? Something about... Um, 
Oh man, what do they call it? Like a trout beaver, beaver trout? Oh yes, I've seen pictures of that. Yeah, that's very definitely a hoax. Oh but, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. But it's it's a fun little hoax though. I, yeah. I at least I assume. Well, Joe's attitude is hoaxes are fun. You know, let's go with it. You know, <laughs> let's keep it going. You know, if somebody deliberately pulls a hoax, why not have some fun with it? Exactly. Why not? Um, I mean, but who knows? Maybe sometime down the line, we might actually genetically see one, and it's not even man. -ma uh, well, I don't. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say man-made, but I mean, you know what I mean. Like, it's not. It wasn't like we just took fake fur and stuffed it on a dead trout. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, like P.T. Barnum's famous Fiji mermaid, where he sewed a monkey head onto a fish or something back in the 19th century. And he made a lot of money exhibiting that thing. So, yeah. <laughs> the public likes to be fooled, I think, sometimes. And the 19th century, newspapers had much lower scruples about honesty than they do today. And very often on slow news day, a newspaper would print a deliberate hoax uh, just to uh, sell papers. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they needed to get their... Uh, their brand of newspaper out somehow so they kind of needed to create something that would be um, out of this world I guess or something mm -hmm. that you wouldn't really necessarily come across nowadays so I mean I get it it's like uh, you know you gotta pull something out of your, your behind just to, just to kind of maybe fake it which is probably 90% of the news that we get now, now. but I mean I don't know I, I maybe that's why I don't really watch TV that much anymore because I don't I can't really tell what true or fake anymore um, not to get political but yeah I mean <laughs> I, um, but yeah so Robert you you've done a lot I mean so we'll talk a little bit about your illustrations a little bit so when you and Joe started which uh, that was your first book, Vermont Ghost Experience? Yep, this is the first one we did back, um, I think it was 2014. 2014, 2016, I can't remember anymore. Yeah, I think <laughs> it, was, it was back, I think it was 2014. Oh, let me look, it should say inside. This is the third edition, by the way, uh, let's see. Oh, 2016, you're right. 2016. Perfect. I think we started working on it in 2014. Oh, probably. Yeah, I know you guys known each other for a while before you guys actually met up, too. So. Yes, we were aware of each other's work. I first heard of him when he did his radio commentary on uh, Vermont Public Radio. He would read his little stories. So that's when I first heard of Joe Citro, and I was fascinated. And he was aware of my work because he'd seen it in galleries and so forth. But it was thanks to the miracle of Facebook that we finally connected. And then he came to a show that I was doing. There was a little mini Comic Con happening in Minuski. And he came to visit. And that's when we first met in person. And we hit it off right away because we have a lot in common. We're both old Vermonters, you know, going way back. And we have similar outlook on life and history and so forth. So um, it was his idea. He said, How would you like to illustrate some books for me? And I said, Sure. He had worked with other artists. He'd worked with Steve Bissett. They did the Monster Guide together and so forth. But Steve is very busy doing other projects. So Joe said, uh, let's give it a try. So we did the Ghost Experience, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, one thing led to another, and we've done all the others. Perfect, man. And here you are, like, five books later or something like that. I just said, like I said, I kind of walked Six books and two maps, and we're currently working on the third edition of the Vermont Ghost Guide. So we hope to have that out in a month or two. So for people who may be wondering, uh, Robert, I already heard from you when I met you at the con about, for those that may be wondering themselves if they work on Amazon, because that seems to be the only place to find your guys' work nowadays is uh, Amazon because of uh, the books, uh, retailers that you know are so fond against Amazon and stuff but anyway the point to this is um, they may have noticed that it said that the second 
edition of the Vermont Ghost Guide looks like it's out of print. So yes. I guess that's why we're doing the third edition. What happened was the, the the first edition he did years ago with Steve. The second edition he and I did a few years ago, and it was published by Erie Lights. But our contract ran out with Erie Lights, and so it's out of print. So that's why we're doing the third edition, which will have additional material. And that one we've decided to self-publish under our Bat Books imprint. And that way we uh, we don't have to worry about going out of print. One of the advantages of self-publishing is you never go out of print. It's always available. So we can just keep issuing them on demand. There are local bookstores that will carry our books. Uh, there's one particular chain that I won't mention that won't, but the small independent bookstores in the small towns will carry the books. And as, I, as you mentioned, they're available on Amazon and you can contact us if you want one. <laughs> and I sell them whenever I do a con somewhere. That's right, so, you do. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of uh, cons and stuff, so I have two for you that I want to bring up anyway, and I don't have it in front of me, but um, I do have it pulled up on a tab. But anyway, one of the, maybe, uh, maybe I'll start with the um, the older one. So you guys kind of uh, did a different, or um, a different take, I'll say. So like, uh, example, you just put up the Vermont Ghost, experience then you guys tried to do like your very own uh vermont horror comic yep yes this was a lot of fun his idea was let's do a little mini graphic novel to you know so it's done totally in comic book format and so he chose three or four of his favorite stories and our idea was that we're ghost hunters, you know, <laughs> and let's go out and investigate these stories. So he, as usual, he wrote it and I uh, illustrated it. The cover is reference to the famous story of the frozen folk of Farmer Morse, um, where back in the 19th century, uh, supposedly uh, old people were frozen in the snow and then thawed out in the spring to save money. So, <laughs> yeah, and not just that, there were, used to be some somebody actually kept like a journal about this as well. Right, and, yeah. Um, well, he got invited or something to witness right. the, the process. So we had a lot of fun. I had to come up with a cartoon version of ourselves, which I did. And um, it was a lot of it was done very tongue in cheek. Um, I like old cars, so I had us driving this uh, old car <laughs> everywhere. And um, I created the, the crypto castle. I, we pretended that was our headquarters. It was this nice. big house. <laughs> was, there, <laughs> was there some sort of inspiration, though, behind the crypto castle? Like, No, he just said, you know, make it fancy. And I love Victorian houses. So hey, who I, doesn't? I just went wild and said, you know, this is the kind of house I'd love to live in. <laughs> well, I was a ghost hunter. That's fair. That's fair. Well, I lived in a modest little ranch-style house, and one time I was interviewed by Seven Days, and they said, we thought for sure you'd be living in a Victorian house. <laughs> said, if only I could afford one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when we did the um, haunted house map, Vermont has hundreds of haunted houses, but I told Joe, pick out the ones that are most interesting to draw. You know, don't give me the dull-looking houses. I want the really interesting-looking houses. So that's what we did. <laughs> Well, actually, now that you mentioned that, uh, you, you might have to bring that poster back on for those uh, that are visually seeing this on uh, YouTube. But there is one location on this, ha quote, haunted house uh, map of yours that sh technically isn't a house. It's actually a bridge. So it's actually Stoke uh, Emily's Bridge. I love the story that Joe told me, but I'd like to hear, like, your opinion on that one. Joe is somewhat skeptical about the Emily Bridge story. He thinks that it was probably fabricated. He can't say for sure, but um, there are people who have claimed to have had paranormal experiences on the bridge. He himself went to the bridge and didn't experience anything. He suspects that somebody concocted the story 
but it, somehow that story got legs and it just sort of took off it's probably vermont's most famous haunted place anytime he does a lecture or if i go to con inevitably the first thing people bring up is oh yeah emily's bridge so it's almost gotten to the point where he's sick of talking about it because anytime he does a lecture inevitably somebody asks him about emily's bridge <laughs> well then he's gonna hate me probably <laughs> Uh, if we ever do a video interview together. But anyway, so what I love about this, though, is like, so I've been to the bridge back uh, when I used to investigate with my old team, and we had a, excuse me, an interesting night where we actually captured some weird images. Um, we didn't get any EVPs, unfortunately, because the water from underneath the bridge kind of ruined the uh, the audio recording. So we did capture any type of responses the water was too much in the way and I didn't have any special program to try to maybe remove the water so if there was EVP there I don't know but either way I got scratched I've caught some other interesting stuff we tried the whole like parking your car on the bridge and it's supposed to like fog up or you're supposed to get scratches or something on your car we actually got a scratch on the car but i mean for all i don't know i mean my buddy said that it wasn't there and uh but i mean i really don't know it's not like i really uh looked at his car th thoroughly f before the uh investigation as well well who knows it could be something to it i i've never been there i've never seen it myself so i don't know and there you have it, Robert. I just know uh, Stowe is, is Stowe kind of takes the bridge into um, you know its own thing too, where they have it on the uh, the free maps that you can get. They actually show Emily Bridge on that map. You know, there's postcards for it. Uh, there's like little small painting that people have done. Well, it's certainly become famous. Whether there's anything to it or not, it's yeah. well known. Oh, yeah, it definitely is. So, I mean, there's even now, like, a, I think I saw a puzzle. And, I mean, I know I'm haunted Vermont and all, and um, unfortunately I don't have it with me right now, but I even have a toady bag that my buddy <laughs> made for haunted Vermont for Emily Bridge because I just like the bridge a lot. So, And I thought it would be a neat design to have. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, real quick, Robert. So, um you know i'll get this question out of the out of the way too but dan dan flanders was asking you what's the scariest tale that you've ever il illustrated hmm illustrated hmm let me think about that uh let me, let me quickly peruse these books the scariest story i ever heard was the one my wife told me about the house that she grew up in but the, the scariest illustration. Hmm. Well, while you're looking for your or for the illustration, if you have a minute, what's the story behind this uh, this old house that you're talking about? Uh, my wife grew up in a house in Winooski that was haunted by what they called the man in the black hat. He would appear on the stairway, but you wouldn't be able to see his feet. He like just sort of faded away, and they had instances where objects would appear and disappear uh, like something would vanish like a piece of jewelry or something and then it would reappear in thin air and just drop onto the floor and they would hear music at night the house itself was built in the early 19th century it was very old and so it got so bad that eventually they had to get an exorcist in and um, that that solved the problem they after that the spirit went away so, um, let me see here, boy. <laughs> Probably the most interesting one that resonates with me, my favorite illustration is this one. Uh, this is from the flood of 1927, where a house, the floating house, uh, where yeah, it floats down the river and um, there's people in it and they said, well, I guess we're gone. And they they go down the river and die. Flooding is played a central role in Vermont's history. My father 
who grew up in Rutland, lost everything in 1947 when uh, Rutland was flooded. So I grew up hearing stories about flooding. The cotton mill ghost, that's Burlington. Yep. Woman who was struck down by a train and um, she haunts the area. She haunts the, the old cotton mill. Uh, the Dutton house is interesting. Uh, this is an example of, of my theory that ghosts are embedded in materials because that house originally was in Chester where Joe grew up. And then it was built in the 16th century, I believe, or 17th century. And they dismantled it and brought it to the Shelburne Museum. And when they did, the ghost came with it. So <laughs> it was known to be haunted when it was in its original location. But when they rebuilt it in Shelburne, people have seen ghosts in it. <clears throat> so that supports my theory that ghosts are somehow embedded in materials. Right. Well, ghosts are known to have their own, uh, uh, what's the good word, like essence into like an object. So maybe the ghost that went with that house, even though it moved down, if it's in the the wood or if they even took some sort of specific item that was in the original house before moving it, maybe that's what it's attached to. So, and I've always told people too like if you get a rundown house and you're trying to do it like a fixer upper the first thing that the 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 energy of the house per se is it's going to notice you repairing it so people may not think that's that energy but it is you're actually restoring the energy of a rundown house so if anything you're creating more energy which um, in my own opinion, that's why we get the, like, uh, the energy activity goes up when you hear people say, like, oh, I got the fixer-upper, but now all of a sudden, like, I feel like there's activity that hasn't, that wasn't there previously, but mm -hmm. every time I do work on the house, it's almost like there's more, and it's like, well, yeah, you're feeding the activity. You're, you're, you're feeding the house, you're restoring it to its glory, and, um, you know, most of the time, the, pr the presents that are there, they, they want to make sure that their old house, or their house, depending on how you want to look at it, is uh, treated well. So, I, that's my theory. Well, oftentimes, ghosts are seen, like, for instance, going through a wall, and then research shows that where they go through the wall used to be a door. And so they're like on a film loop, going through the same activity, going up the same stairway, or appearing in the same window over and over and over again. That's right. You may remember back in the, I don't know how old you are, but back in the 70s, there was this fad called Curlin Photography, where people would put their hands on special film and they would photograph it and it would create, they'd see these aura or energy patterns around the hand. And, um, it's a well-known fact, the human body and human brain operate on electricity. Uh, we're basically electromagnetic chemical energy factories. You know, we generate energy. So we put out energy waves, and I suspect that sometimes those waves are absorbed or the patterns are recorded in materials. And, um, or even locations, ground. Uh, you know, there are haunted trees, there's haunted patches of ground it could be anything oh yeah like the state like the um the indonesian people would believe that there's uh um spirits in the trees like everything has a spirit mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um i thought you were gonna go with like um the old-fashioned film of cameras where what do they call it like ghost faces ghost something oh yeah uh ghost photos i forget what they call it but you know it they uh, kind of like, like what you were just saying though you can move your arm but then next thing you know you could be going like this and then they take the picture but then it looks like you know there's a ghost over here but it might have just been me yeah. but they think it's like they're dead mm -hmm. relatives um so anyway uh we 
we, uh, I, I wouldn't mind wrapping this up with your latest one there, your, uh, your Green Mountain Ghostly Gallery one that you just did with yep. Joe. This um, one, yeah. Yep, correct, though. So, um, you know, what can you tell us about that? And, uh, you know, is there, are you kind of going back to, like, what Dan Flanders was asking, is there a, 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 a scary illustration in there that you love to do? Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Which one was my favorite? Probably the haunted train. The interesting thing about this book, Joe's idea was it'd be like an art gallery. So he said, let's do the illustrations in different styles. All my drawings are done digitally, by the way. And they're done um, with a digital pen and a digital tablet. So some of them, I make them with gray tones, like a painting. Whereas other ones, the idea was to make them more like a scratch board effect. Let's see if I can find one here. Scratch board, is that more like a... a... It's sort of reverse pen and ink, where you start with a black surface, and then, like, that's a scratch board effect. So oh, you, yeah, you yeah. You start yeah. with a black surface, and then you scratch out the highlights. Um, so some of them are done that way, and then some of them were done... In pen and ink style. So I can find one of those. Yeah. So like this one was done as if it was like a pen and ink drawing. Uh, the unlikely visitation. Yep. Yeah. So there's just a because on the other books I did them all. Let's we'll see. This book was all done in pen and ink style. Uh, what what book is this one? This is the uh, first one we did. Oh, the, the Vermont uh, creepiest classic. Creepiest classic. And, but the ghost, the co he really liked the cover on this. This was a lot of fun. I used Photoshop. I used Photoshop to make all these, and I was able to create this semi-translucent effect of the ghost using um, uh, eraser tools and so forth. So that was a lot of fun to do. It is always nice. So, like you were saying, you know, you you and Joe are taking this old book, basically, adding new stuff and hopefully trying to do like 13 volumes and everything. So um, I know Joe's not here to say what, you know, like what he would say about it. But uh, so I guess we'll, we'll try to do our best or I'll try to do my best to ask you for your own take here is so when Joe and and uh, Joe asked you like hey I got the next idea this is this is how I kind of want it so how how give us a little idea of like what went into this this one well basically the first step is he'll send me the story and then I'll read it over and I'll pick out images that I think would work dramatically and interestingly Mm -hmm. Every story has at least one or two dramatic points that would make a good drawing. So then I do a rough thumbnail, just a quick, quick sketch, what I call a concept sketch, which I send back to him. I said, this is what I'm thinking should happen in this picture. But there's no idea. It's just a very rough idea. And then he'll amend it. He'll say, well, let's tweak this or add that. Or he may say, no, I like it the way it is. And once he signed off on it, then I go ahead and do the finished version. And then I send that to him, and then he looks it over and decides whether yay or nay. And either we adjust it or we take it. He takes it. And if he takes it, then it gets put in the book. Our goal was to have two or three drawings per chapter plus the title page for each chapter. Plus the cover, and the front cover and the back cover. Now, something like the Ghost Guide, which was our most ambitious project, I had to make hundreds of drawings for this one because I had to make one for every single page. So, there's a lot of drawings in this one. <laughs> but um, the same process. I would just suggest this is what I think will work. And... Um, Yay or nay. And, and he will say, you know, either we'll adjust it or we won't. And then we'll go from there. So we have... Um, I, I usually acquiesce to his 
ideas because technically these are really his books. So um, if he says he wants it done a certain way, that's the way I do it. You know, it's always his his decision is always final. Right. Well, there, there's one in there. That I don't believe it was your drawing. It was. Um, I might have been like like an old photograph that like from yeah he also books. adds photos to the books yeah like um uh, what did they call it what did he call it i mean um it was either called like the silk road bridge or the red bridge okay then that one um I, that's the one in bennington i don't know uh, if you ha knew anything about that one or not um Basically, it's like an old bridge uh, from Bennington that got originally got torn down, but Joe kind of mentioned it because there's really not much about it, and on the back of the postcard, it mentioned something about, like, on a moonless, or on a moonlit night, you can hear, like, a, like a headless guy going across the bridge and into, like, a, like a farmland or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um... But yeah, I mean, not not all of it is, I guess, illustrations. I guess is what I'm going to say. So, um, so I guess Robert is, is like, so you know, when you're when you're doing these with Joe too, like, is there any particular one, even in this book, since we're talking about uh, this Vermont Ghostly Gallery, like, was there one story in here where you kind of read it and went oh man like like i really like this one or like you um, know, like maybe something like you knew about it beforehand but maybe joe touched on it more or something and um you know it was um, like, hmm. like one that really stood out to you i guess is what i'm trying to say well let me see my the one that i really like in this book Gosh, it's hard to say. It's like picking your favorite child here. Um, I'm partial to interesting buildings. This was a fun story. Othello gets lifted off the floor by a ghostly hand during a, a thunderstorm. Um, that was a fun one to do. Oh, that was the, uh, the scratch out one that you yeah. were talking about. Um, railroad disasters are, uh, I like to read about because I had ancestors who worked on the Rutland Railroad. So there was a story in here about a rail a train going off the rails. Um, hmm. Yeah, this one was fun. Like father and son hear a train, the ghost train. Trains are fun to do. Is that the, uh, the West Haven one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would well, as I said, once he sends me the text, I read it over, and generally, an image will pop into my head. You know, there'll be a certain paragraph that said, "Oh, yeah, this is this is the one that I need to illustrate." Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, all right, Robert. Well, to end to end it, I guess is like for those that are wanting to become like a cartoonist or a uh, painter, just real quick. I mean. You know, what type of advice would you give them? Or, like, what type of technique would you say to try to see if they like it? Well, my only advice is it's a job and you got to do it every day. So my advice is to set up some place in your home or somewhere, a studio, where everything's laid out so you don't have to drag out all your materials every time you want to be creative. And then just do it over and over and over and over again. Somebody once said that all art is really made up of two parts. It's made up of technique and poetry. The poetry is what you have to say as an artist, and the technique is how you say it. As an art teacher, I can only teach technique. I can't give you the poetry. Either you have it or you don't. To master the technique, you've got to practice, practice, practice. But if you're not motivated by the poetry, you're not going to bother. So, you know within your own soul, do I have the drive to devote the hours and hours and hours and hours necessary to master technique? 
do you have something to say? Picasso once said, every work of art is really a self-portrait. That's a good one. I, I don't think I've heard that one. So that's a good one. I like regardless, it. regardless of the actual subject matter, what you're really talking about is yourself. So, I like that. That's a good. Alrighty. One. All right, Robert. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know we had some, um, you know, some hassle on the original uh, link, so we had to like figure out something real quick, which is why my background kind of sucks right now. But that's all right. Uh, anyway, so Robert, you're like you mentioned before, and we'll just say it again for those that are interested in your work, uh, where can they reach out to you? But you know what? Before before um, I uh, we we get there, uh, is there any upcoming project either from you or you and Joe that you're working on? And you know what? How silly of me too. I never asked you about your your book that you did. The uh, Western Known Haunted Houses, so how stupid of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that that's actually a parody. Uh, that's all done humorously. It's my satire of every known horror trope. And that is available through uh, Eerie Lights. And that's also available on Amazon. Uh, it's called The Lesser Known Haunted Houses. Um, uh as I said, Joe and I are working on the third edition of the Ghost Guide, and um, and after that, we'll probably resume work on the Green Mountain Dark Tales project. And um, people want to see my work; they go to my website, Mr. 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 Brunel. dot com, or just Google my name, Robert Brunel, and you'll find links to everything. I'm all over. I'm all over the interwebs. So. <laughs> And um, hopefully, I'll be doing the nonfiction comic fest in November at the library in Burlington. That's my next gig. It's invitation only. I applied. I'm a, I've done it every year. I'm hoping they invite me back. And if I do, um, I'll have my books and things for sale there. Nice. Nice. Now, are you still are you still doing your drawing for uh, seven days, or did they completely kick you out? They dropped me. They ran it for four years, and then they dropped it. But um, I am up for uh, best cartoonist on the seven daisies. So we'll see. I'll find out at the end of August whether I get that or not. Well, there you go. Well, I'm always. People are always saying, "I wish they'd bring your strip back," and my response is, "Write a letter to the editor and tell them that." That's the best That's way to do it. Demand it. Yeah, demand it but, back. Um, it, it does appear in Funny Times, which is a national humor magazine. Nice. And it's on the website uh, Humor Times, which is another publication. And it also appears in a <clears throat> a sometimes periodical called Exploitation Nation. You can see it there, or you can see it on Facebook because I post new ones every week. Very nice. Yeah, it's always fun reading your little strip, especially. That's how I know what's going on in the world, to be to be honest there, Robert, is all I got to do is look for your cartoon, and I'll be like, oh, so this is what's going on, this is what I missed. <laughs> so, um, if this podcast appears like on YouTube or something, send me the link, and then I'll share it on Facebook so people can see it. Yeah, definitely. And, um, yeah, just for what everybody else know, too, is uh, thank you for watching, and... Uh, you know, check out MrBrunel.com and, you know, write to him, tell him Paul sent you and that you want all his stuff because it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but Sounds no, good. really, uh, Robert, again, thank you for your time so much. Uh, well, yeah. okay, I'm glad we made it work. We did. <laughs> we did. So hopefully we can figure out what happened last time. So now that I know this new trick, too, um, it'll be a lot more easier, too. So. You know, I prefer the messenger video over Zoom. I find it the easiest, most user friendly, and I've never had it fail on me. That's right. The only thing I just need to needed to figure out is uh, screen recording, which I did find out. <coughs> so that was good. All right. So everybody else, keep your eyes open because you never know if an apparition.